Welcome to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Isabel Wilkerson, I'm so excited that you're here to talk about CAST. Thank you for having me. (laughs) (laughs) You must be exhausted. You must be doing like a thousand interviews every day. You're on every list of recommended books everywhere. You're like, how are you holding up? Uh, Well, you just power through because, you know, this is what you have to do. I mean, you know, you don't, no one could have expected how this year would turn out. You know, you just simply could not have imagined the idea of putting, you know, working on something for so long and for so hard. And then to, you know, to um, introduce it to the world in the midst of a global pandemic, it's just, you know, I, I, you just never could have imagined. And I want to always say, of course, that, you know, compared to people who are really experiencing challenges in this world at this time, this is, you know, this is so low in the totem pole in terms of what I'm going through here at all. Like it's just a whole, it's not in the same category of true suffering. <laughs> But um, it does create challenges and it, it can be exhausting, but it's, um, it's, it's necessary. And I'm just glad that we have ways to be able to speak to people and to be able to communicate, you know, as I am here with you. I mean, what would we do without it? I don't know. We'd be like back in another century. <laughs> we can dive back into some of your research and we can imagine <laughs> what it would be like. Um, well, I'm glad you're holding up enough to at least chit chat a little today. Um, your book, by, before I read it, my mother was like, this is the most amazing book you've ever, you'll ever read. And so when I know that, I'm like, all right, I better sit down, button up, and then we have to have a whole talk about it. And <laughs> Obviously, everybody's mother and sibling and everyone has now read this book, which is amazing. Tell me about all the research it took to do this. How about the thousands of interviews for both this and uh, the warmth of other sons? And also, like, what do you think makes a great interview? Like, how do you extract the information you need from other people? Those are really great questions. I mean, for one thing, uh, the work that I do is called narrative nonfiction. So uh, it, it, it combines um, what, you know, ideally would be the best of both worlds, meaning that you have to do a tremendous amount of research in order to find uh, and to be able to um, determine and excavate truths that are verifiable fact that you, you know, that help explain some phenomenon. And then you translate that into a narrative in the, you know, using many of the tools that novelists would use so that the best of both worlds would be, you're learning something, you're exposed to a phenomenon you otherwise would not know about, but it's told in such a way that hopefully it builds suspense, it's a page turner, it tells a story, you get involved in the people. And so to do that takes a long time. You know, I say that I have sort of the gestational uh, lifespan of an, of an elephant, you know, <laughs> <laughs> It takes a long time. I mean, The Warmth of the Suns took 15 years. You know, I say that if it were a human being, it would be in high school and dating. That's how long it took me to to work on that book. And then this one, I got a little bit better. It took, you know, about um, eight years of germinating and distilling it and thinking about it. And and in the course of that, it means that one um, project kind of leads into the other. And this grew out of The Warmth of the Suns, which is where I started first using the word cast you know, to describe, you know, the hierarchies built into our country going back to colonial times. And I use that word because it was, it was the most comprehensive, accurate way to describe the world that a lot of us don't even know about. You know, it's a world in which, you know, the, the world, the, the hierarchy of the American South for much of our country's history was so tightly delineated, it was this graded ranking of human value that went on until essentially the 1970s, you know, legally, formally, until the 19, basically the 1960s legislation, but then didn't take effect until the 1970s. So this was a world where it was against the law for black people and white people to merely play checkers together in Birmingham. I mean, there were there was a, a you know a white Bible and altogether separate black Bible to swear to tell the truth on in court, you know, the very word of God was segregated in that era. And it could mean your very life if you breached any of the protocols and laws of that system. So that's what I was describing in The Warmth of Other Sons. And that was the term I started to use, casts. It was more evocative. Um, it was more comprehensive. And it was language that anthropologists who had studied the Jim Crow South actually used as well. So the second book grew out of the first. And um, it kind of got... Um, uh, it's what what started it was really what happened with Trayvon Martin, you know, where he was uh, a teenager walking home from a convenience store in a you know suburban subdivision in Florida, where 
his very image, you know, what he looked like was viewed as suspicious by someone who, you know, stopped and, and ultimately killed him. And, and so that was, a, that actually occurred in an area, a part of Florida, that one of the people that I had, one of the protagonists from the Warmth of the Sons was from that same area. So it sparked my uh, interest and attention from the very start. And I, um, I wrote a piece in, uh, an op-ed piece in the New York Times, um, connecting cast to what had happened to him. And so that was really the beginning of my thinking that led to this book. And tell me a little bit about when you interview people, what you do to get them yeah. to open up and, and what are some of the things you look for when you're, when you're talking to somebody new? Like, what is that about for you? And what are some of the things that you've really taken away from, from people you've met all over the world? That's such a great question because I don't consider myself to do interviews really. The kind of work that I'm doing takes a lot of time. So I don't have often, so in, because I don't, I don't, it, it, I both don't have enough time. There's never enough time. <laughs> <laughs> apropos of the title yes. <laughs> of your podcast. Nobody has any time for anything. Yes. But you know, there's a saying that there's this um, Cuban saying, I certainly believe it's Cuban. It's like, it, it says something along the lines of slow down. I'm in a hurry. I think that's an interesting way of, of thinking about life itself. And so because there's never enough time and yet the work that I do takes time, I end up not, I end up, you know, uh, allowing myself to the time to spend with people as opposed to, a, you know, a Q&A, because I'm not going to be able to learn what I need to learn if I have like a set of questions for the, for the work that I do. Because the work that I do is attempting to get deep into the hearts and the minds of people, into their motivations, into their thoughts, their dreams, their you know, their triumphs and their tribulations, you know, what they've actually been through. And it's hard to even, in, to even um, formulate a single question that will elicit, elicit from someone, you know, your, your deepest dreams, thoughts, and motivations, you know, so I have to spend time with people. So I generally do more closely what we would identify with um, anthropologists, which is participant observation, ethnography, spending time with them, um, getting to know them in a more relaxed and sort of hopefully more holistic way. And it just takes a tremendous amount of time. It does. And I, for the one for the sons, for example, I ended up, um, you know, going to the places in order to find the, the protagonist for that book. I had to, you know, go to the places where they would be. I went to, there were actually uh, Baptist churches in um, in, in Brooklyn, where everyone was from South Carolina, and there were Catholic churches in uh, California, where everyone was from Louisiana, obviously writing about the great migration of people who went from the South and then spread out to the rest of the country following beautifully predictable streams. And so that's what I found in the pro process of that. And then once I got to, I interviewed over 1,200 people for that, you know, basically a casting call, you know, it was like an auditioning people for the role of being a protagonist in this book. And that's where I had a chance to, to meet many, many people. But for the most part, I just, you know, I just in some ways throw out prompts just to get people talking and to see where that leads and to allow them to talk. Whatever it is that can get them to feel comfortable and to talk is what I, I would do. And generally it means asking fewer questions than you might think. I mean, a lot of it is just is responding to what they've said to keep the conversation going, um, to you know, make it conversational, um, to sort of sit at their knee and to hear their experiences, to make it comfortable for them, essentially to um, till the soil, to make it um, receptive to whatever is pouring forth from them. You know, that, that's, what, that's what this is all about. And it just takes a lot of time. It really does. And some of the people end up telling me things that they hadn't told their own children because they had been through so much pain and trauma that they didn't want to, they, they didn't want to burden their children with that. They didn't want to revisit it. It was post-traumatic stress for a lot of the people who endured and suffered and survived Jim Crow. So they were saying, telling me things that were very, very painful. So the most that I can do is um, be the very best listener that I can be, um, be encouraging empathetic understanding and to validate their experiences and their feelings. That's what my job is. And so once you 
once you have to absorb all of that stress and trauma and history and narrative that's very disturbing, how do you then walk away and have like a normal night? Do you know what I mean? Like, how do you extract yourself from that intensity and deal with those emotions aside from obviously turning it into a best selling narrative nonfiction book, but emotionally? Like, how do you, how do you toggle back and forth from, from that, you know, intimacy, really? Well, one of the, uh, I think it's probably um, one's individual constitution that makes the person uh, more um, likely to be able to think long term about something. And that's how I am. I mean, it's a, these are huge projects that take a long time. And I am, I go into it knowing that it's going to take a long time and I'm going to have to sit with it, live with it um, for a long time. So there's several answers to that question. One of them is that I, often focus in on people for, with whom I already have developed or feel that there is some kind of connection. There's some chemistry that makes me feel that I want to spend time with them and they want to spend time with me because this is a long haul journey here. I mean, this is really, you know, years in the making. And so you have to feel that there's a connection that can power you through. Uh, so that's one of them. So you end up feeling in, in this, in the case for, for the things that I do, I end up you know, absorbing myself into what their lives have been. I mean, I have this, you know, I just, you know, can't think, be, I am by definition kind of an empath. I just am, so I absorb it. That's just who I am. And um, knowing that it's going to be for the long haul, it means that I have um, absorbed, you know, who they are into my being. They become part of me. And so I just live with it. They become part of me. All of the people that I write about on some level become part of me. And I don't view that as draining as much as enriching because I get to know these amazing, incredible people. And if I didn't you know, find, a, have a chemistry and love for them, then it would be harder for the reader to experience that as well. I mean, if I feel this love and connection to them, the reader will as well. I mean, I think that the, the way, particularly The Warmth of the Suns has been received, I mean, the, the book has been out for 10 years and it was on the bestseller list when it first came out and it's back on the bestseller list again, you know, 10 years later, it's incredible. And I think that that's because people can feel the connection, the love, the empathy, they can see themselves in the people. I say that narrative nonfiction is the closest that you get to being another person because we know that empathy can be um, elicited when we read novels, but non narrative nonfiction allows you to feel that same empathy for people who were real, who actually existed. And, uh, and so what, what allows me to get through it is my sense of connection, um, compassion, and in fact, love and admiration for the people that I'm writing about. That does not mean that I'm writing about them, you know, as if they're perfect. I mean, they are, you know, you get to see them in their full humanity. Um, it actually is a disservice to people, I think, to, to overly romanticize a person. I mean, I think that, you know, a full humanity means the range of emotions and experiences. And so that's what comes through. But that's one of the things that powers me through, that gets me through the really difficult aspects. The other thing is that is ultimately the reader. I mean, I embark upon these, these projects, um, these, these uh, massive research, um, you know, invest, you know, a sort of immersion, um, because I ultimately want to share this with readers. And so um, I'm thinking about the reader the whole time, you know, thinking about the reader and knowing that ultimately, whatever it is that I'm having to experience, suffer, go through, will reach someone else. That's what inspires me. Um, I, you know, that I, I love the, um, the uh, definition that Tolstoy gives for art. He says that art is the transfer of emotion from one person to another. That's a, a beautiful, concise description of art, um, the most beautiful that I've heard. And that is what this is. I mean, this is literally being the person in between um, the, the sender of emotion and experience and the receiver of that emotion and experience. The sender is a person who's being, you know, whose story is being told, and the receiver is the is the reader who is now getting to learn and, and, and you know and and immerse um, him or herself in someone else's story. And I am the 
the intercessor. I'm the, the interpreter uh, of that experience. And so that's what I'm thinking about too. And it's not complete until it gets out of me and out to the reader. <laughs> and so, and so that's, what, that's what also inspires me and motivates me even through some of the really difficult parts of the work that I have to do. So when, how did this all get started? When you were young, did you, you referred to your constitution earlier. Were you always this empathetic? Like, give me a picture of you in like seventh grade or, you know, preschool. Like, were you always the one like connecting everybody? And when did you know you wanted to embark on these like deep dives into other people's lives? Actually, like a lot of writers, I, I'm, I'm an introvert, probably an extreme introvert. So that means that uh, I think a lot of writers are observers. So they're people who were who were always um, the quiet one, you know, um, you know, with a book in hand, um, you know, the, that child with, you know, uh, with the flashlight, you know, in, 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 in your in bed with the flashlight under the covers reading a book. That was that was uh, who I was. And am uh, and I, you know, so I was I was feeling that connection through the stories that I was reading growing up. I was also the person who was, you know, usually the quiet one um, on the sidelines, observing all the action that other people might have been in the midst of. That doesn't mean that there weren't times where I might have been, you know, involved. But generally speaking, I'm very content to be, um, you know, the one who's um, watching, uh, um, observing um interpreting you know um examining and thinking about what is going on around me and and the way that it comes out is through the writing that's how it comes out well i think you can maybe put aside your flashlight i think i, I think you've graduated to perhaps a, a lamp on your bedside table at this point what do you think are you still hiding <laughs> uh, no, no, sy symbolically of course I, I, <laughs> long past that, but it's the idea of being really, um, being able to lose yourself in, in a story. No, I'm um, kidding. I feel, and yeah. I feel the same way. I also oh, yeah. <laughs> had a flashlight. I did. I literally, I would like hide in my bathroom and read Charlotte's web and like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I still, now I'm like, my husband sleeps next to me and the light is on and you know, I'm the same way. I, 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 and I was also very quiet and observing as a kid. So I relate to everything you're saying. Um, yeah. And it's awesome. So in your book, you set out, obviously, all these different paradigms for analyzing societies, especially how we've gotten to where we are now and through the lens of both cultures in India and the Holocaust and all these other, and Jim Crow South and everything as to why we are the way we are and perhaps we should look at it differently. And I was just wondering, having gone through this complete analysis of our society as it stands today, like how hopeful are you? Like what would you tell kids who are growing up now in this environment, knowing what you know and all you've researched and everything, like what would your advice to them be? Like, do you feel optimistic? about where we can go or not? Well, I wouldn't have written these books if I were not optimistic. It takes a lot of faith and optimism to embark on something that will take years to complete with no guarantee of how it's going to turn out, no guarantee of what the world will be like by the time it comes out. Like, will people even be interested by the time you finally finish this thing you started? So it takes a lot of faith and optimism to even start uh, down the path that each of these books began with. And so I wouldn't have written them if I weren't optimistic. Of course, one of the missions and purpose of these books is to help illuminate aspects of our country's history that we otherwise would not know so that we can together find ways to transcend these artificial barriers and boundaries that have been created long before any of us were you know, any before even our ancestors were, were thought of, because this is going back to 17th century colonial America before there was the United States of America. So the goal of this is to, um, is to shine a light on these aspects of this old house that we call America. You know, I use this analogy, this metaphor about our country being like an old house that we've all inherited and none of us alive are the ones who built it but it's our responsibility now that we are in this house. And so that's the purpose of all of this. The purpose is to somehow find a way to recognize um, what we have inherited, like to really look closely at what we've inherited in hopes that we can um, make the 
uh, improvements, um, make the repairs, the massive repairs that are necessary in order for it to be as strong as it needs to be. So that's where my hopefulness comes. And also people's response to what happened over the summer, you know, after George Floyd, there was a sense of um, uh, alarm and outrage that needed to be, uh, that was absolutely warranted and, and, and that many, many people, not just in our country, but around the world felt and responded to and a sense that this should not be happening uh, in this country or any country, um, but especially not in our country, given our creed and what we stand for. And it should not absolutely not be happening now. And I think that that's where I get a lot of hopefulness. The fact that people did respond the fact that people did recognize how um, woeful and how tragic that this is happening in our current era. So this is probably none of my business, but when you are not being a Pulitzer Prize winning author and researcher and all the amazing things that you're doing to help the country, like what do you do in your spare time? Like what do you enjoy doing? What do you, how do you use time when you're not like at your desk or at your computer? Like what's your, what are some of your things that make you tick? Well, well sadly for a lot of the, the last uh, year or so, and especially with what's going now, going on now and COVID, you know, um, sadly that is pretty much a, a lot <laughs> that takes up a vast majority of my uh, waking time because that's what the circumstances, you know, require. So it's almost like the question you're asking is almost like, Pre, pre COVID, but you know, you know, so much of my time is spent um, in just absolutely loving being able to travel and to see new and amazing cultures connecting in that way. Um, that's, you know, massive, massive, massively um, central to, to who I am, uh, obviously. Um, I, you know, I love to, um, you know, spend, obviously spend time out in nature in any way that I can, and especially, um, with, um, you know, just, you know, digging in the soil and, you know, um, like seeing what can, you know, the, the art of what can happen when you plant something and, and have it to grow. Um, you know, I'm such a tremendous, tremendous um, animal, um, animal lover, animal rights advocate. I mean, I just absolutely um, can't imagine life without having <laughs> some... <laughs> some kind of um, animal in one's life. You know, I, I'm a big, you know, dog lover. So, um, but I, I mean, I, I love all kinds of animals. So what I'm saying is there are many, many sources of joy in addition, of course, to family and, and friends and, and how what's really important in life. But, um, you know, the circumstances in, in which that we find ourselves now means that, you know, it's the, the world is the way that it is. And, and um, that's, that's what's necessary right now. And I, um, it's been um, uh, uh, not for, for writers. It's not a difficult transition to the world that we're in now in terms of being interior, um, being um, still in, uh, engaged with words and engaged with, you know, talking about words. That's very, very natural because that's what we do. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I was literally just saying yesterday that I couldn't, I have a, a black lab that I recently inherited from my mother-in-law who passed away and I have like fallen in love with, and I was like, I can't believe that I have the capacity yeah. for this much love for an animal. Like I, and every time I'm with her thinking about how much I love her, I'm already thinking like, what am I going to do when she's not around? You know, which is stupid, right? It's like, cause you just know with people, you can fool yourself that they'll be around forever. But with animals, you can't, I, I mean, yeah. at least I found you yeah. can't sort of. Have that anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, um, um, COVID, you know, has been such a, you know, such a devastation to everyone, and more, more particularly, people who have actually who have who have suffered from it directly, uh, clearly. Uh, but there, you know, it's been going on for long enough that many things, both good and bad, in life also happen because it's been going on for so long. And one of the things that happened is that I did, I lost my beloved Westy, who was oh, uh, no. 17. He'd made it to 17. And um, in the early months of COVID, um, he, he passed away. It was, you know, so that was one of the things you realize. You realize how um, they work their way into your heart in ways that you don't expect, in ways that humans 
don't. I mean, you know, they're, they're, it's a different kind of love, but you, you know, they're by your side, essentially living for you, like waiting for, you know, for every gesture uh, coming from you. They literally exist for you. And you, they become so much a part of your life that you don't even think about it until they're no longer there. So um, I had, had, there were two, we had two, and um, now there's one, but they, <laughs> he made it to 17, and so I, I can't complain. Oh, well, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. The, on the street yesterday, I was walking the dog, and, and this older man came over and was just like, can I stop and pet the dog? So of course, I'm like with my mask, like, all right, why is he coming so close to me? But he's like, I lost my German Shepherd after, you know, 14 years, and it only has only been three weeks, and I just have to hug your dog. Anyway, my heart broke, but... Yeah, animal love. Anyway, um, okay, last question because I know you have to go soon. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? You know, I there I I don't have any thing that you haven't probably heard before. So I, I you know apologize in advance for not not being being any more insightful about this. Um, you know, we're often told read, 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 read good things, things that you admire, and things that you. Um, that, that you could learn from because they're not what, you know, they're not as good as they could be. Um, I would say also uh, that, you know, there are people who say, you know, write every single day. And that is true. It's probably a great idea. I, however, believe that there are some of us who I, I, I actually do better when I um, am writing um, because I feel as if I. Um, I am bursting with something that has to be on the page, like where I cannot stop myself from having to write. That I find to be more, um, more productive. This does not mean that you, you don't write, you know, when, when you have to write and you're on deadline, of course you write. But I find them, the, to me, the most inspiring and inspired and effective writing comes from when I feel as if oh my God, where's a piece of paper? I need to write this down right this second. Like I just, I just have to write this down before I lose it. So I, one suggestion I would have is to always have pen and paper or whatever it is, if you write in your device, have it available. And if something hits you, write it down. Then do not, do not um, assume that it will be there tomorrow or next week or next month. Like if, if something hits you, uh, some uh, revelation or some um, uh, way of thinking about something, some idea, some turn of phrase, write it down right then and there because it may not be there again. That's the, the mind works in mysterious ways and you need to capture it while you can. Um, so I always have something nearby that I can write on. Envelopes, what doesn't matter, whatever it is, always have something nearby. Um, I would say to be kind to oneself when things are not coming as you wish them to be. Uh, and know that if you've done it before, you can do it again. It will, it will come. Um, and to give, you know, to, to be patient with yourself because um, I, I personally, as I said, don't believe in, in suffering and torturing yourself when it's not coming, when it's not working. Uh, I, I just don't feel that you should suffer. And of course, if you're on deadline, that's a different thing and you've got to get it done. But the most beautiful things that, that um, are more naturally, holistically uh, emerging from your subconscious will come uh, when, when you least expect it and be there to capture it. Also, in, um, in terms of being uh, you know, kind to oneself and patient one, with oneself is to realize that at all times, when you're working on something, your subconscious is working all the time. It is constantly trying to make sense of what it knows has to come out of you. So to know that even when you're not in front of a screen or for people who, there are many people who still do write and longhand, and I, I like combining both because I think that both, whatever I write in longhand is usually going to be often the most powerful um, meaningful, oddly enough, um, well, well um, constructed observation or passage. Generally, I don't know why that, why that happens. Maybe there's some direct connection from the brain, you know, going through the neck and then through the arms and into the hands. I don't know, maybe some, somebody has studied that, but that's what I find. And so to, to know that, that we are working even when we're not in front of the screen, this, the subconscious is constantly 
trying to make sense of it because it knows it has a job to do. It knows that it needs to get this thing written. It absolutely knows it. And it's working on it whether we realize it or not. And, and then when it, when it reveals itself to us and then when we sit down to write, then it can all pour forth. That's how I work. And, and that's what works for me. Well, maybe this can be your next book, How the Brain <laughs> and the Hand Interact. And you can go around the country and talk to every writer. And I think that would be really cool. I'm sure you have other <laughs> ideas. But <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your time and for the fantastic contributions to literature and for the conversation. So, thank you. I so enjoyed it. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You as well. Okay. Bye. Bye.